Tonight, I want to share a message with you that I've titled, Just Say Yes. Just Say Yes. So I want to start with a question. When is the last time that you said yes to doing a new thing that you have never done before? Maybe skydiving? Any skydivers in the house tonight? You're crazy. Have you done it? Oh, yeah, you're really crazy. <laughs> maybe the first time that you took a class, maybe college, a Bible study. You guys ever done that before? Um, how about running a marathon? Any marathoners in the house? Come on. There are so many new things that you could do. I remember one of those that I did. When I was in college, I had a group of friends that were gymnasts and acrobats. Team Fast was our name. Fearless Acrobatic Stunt Team. Fearless Acrobatic Stunt Team. That's right. We were epic. Now, I was definitely not the guy that could do the coolest tricks. Um, though one time I did, like, my, like, specialty was walking on my hands. Like, that was the best I could do. Um, and so I walked all the way down Main Street on my hands. That was, like, my one claim to fame. Look, I'm awesome. But all of my friends could do double backflips. So, you know. Um, but I loved getting to hang out and do things with that group of guys. Um, one of them was a young man who had a Christian mother and a non-Christian father. And I'll never forget, one day, his mom came to me and said, hey, David, would you just think about this? Like, if you ever have the opportunity to encourage my son, to pray for my son, would you, would you do that? Because his dad is definitely not a believer, and I feel like my son is on the fence. And I've, I've been praying that God would send someone that is a, a Christian young man that can be his friend, that can push him in the right direction. Would you, would you be willing to think about that and pray about that? And I, it really tugged on my heart. Like, I'm like, Jesus, this is the prayer I prayed. Jesus, please give me an opportunity to reach this young man. Whatever it takes and whatever it looks like, Jesus, I just want to see him touched by you. You see, that was a really dangerous prayer. I probably should have worded that a little different. No, just kidding. Uh, but that was a dangerous prayer. And I didn't know when I prayed it how dangerous it was and what God was about to do with that prayer. Can you guess what happened next? The Lord divinely brought him to me and said, David, I feel like you are supposed to speak these vast words of wisdom into my life. And I will hold to them for all of time. Do you believe that's what happened? I wish that's what happened. Um, within about a week or so of me praying that prayer, he came up to me out of the blue, and he said this. Hey, David, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, yes, God's doing it. This is the moment that I prayed for. Would you be willing to join a ballet class with me? Would you be willing to join a ballet class with me? We're looking for guys that we can trust with the young girls, and we knew that you were trustworthy. And immediately in my heart, I'm like, what? <laughs> ballet? Jesus, I did not pray to join a dance class. I prayed to see a young man reach for the gospel. God, did you hear me up there? Or are you a little confused? You see, God doesn't often ask us for our opinion. He asks us for our obedience. God doesn't often ask us for our opinion. He asks us for our obedience. So in that moment, I knew I had a choice to make. Do I run away? Because ballet, to be honest, scared me. <laughs> How many guys in the house would love to do a ballet class? Okay, that's kind of what I thought. <laughs> but I remembered the prayer that I prayed. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, will you do what you asked for or will you run and hide? <sighs> so I put my opinions away. I put my fears away. And I just simply said yes to Jesus. Okay, God, I, I don't want to do it. And it doesn't make any sense. But if this is what you have for me to do, count me in. Church, I just want to say tonight, my life has been marked by the times that I said yes. yes. Marked by the times. You see, I remember when Jesus asked me to live for him when I was in high school. I just said yes. He asked me to give my life to serve in student ministry. I just said yes. 
I, or he asked me to lead Bible camps for years, serve in youth groups and churches all around our community, not for money or recognition, but just to see kids and people come to know him as their savior. I just said yes. He asked me to give up my job and my dreams for the future to serve in full-time ministry. I just said yes. Then, after eight years, he asked me to give up the ministry that I loved for the ministry that we needed, and I just said yes. And that one was a hard yes for me. But who here has ever been blessed or touched by our online ministry? So the yes mattered, even if it was hard. My life has been marked over and over by my yeses to Jesus. Church, your life will be defined by your yeses or your noes to Christ. It will be defined by your yeses or your noes. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 says this, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Let me say it this way. Whoever hustles and grinds to make a life for themselves will lose it. But whoever gives up what could be in the world will find the life that they were made to have in Christ. Am I saying that it is wrong to hustle or to grind or to work hard? Absolutely not. Sometimes, though, we try so hard to build our life without Jesus at the center of it all. And that is like building a house on the sand. You can build it, but I promise that it won't stand forever. You see, as a young man, all I wanted was for God to move in my life. So even at the cost of doing ballet, I said yes. I said yes. Because life is always marked by the moments that we say yes to God. Yes or no. Yes or no. Like a fork in the road, will we trust God and go towards him? Or, we, or will we allow our fear, our pride, our addiction, or just our dumb choices to take us down the wrong path? You see, every single one of us will find us, will find ourselves at that fork of life, that fork in the road moment. And this brings me to Esther's story. She found herself at one of these fork in the road moments in her life. Would Esther say yes, or would it be too hard for her? I want us to jump into the story of Esther, and I want to do something a little fun, a little different tonight. We're going to actually watch a video that will share the whole story of Esther, and I want to make one correction. They do mention that they are uncle and niece, Mordecai and Esther. They're cousins, so I just wanted to say that. That was a mistake, so I apologize for that. Um, they are cousins. Um, but I want us to watch this and learn about Esther and her life. Go ahead and turn your attention to the screen. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. And the main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd, I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days. And it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. 
On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai, but all of a sudden the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep, and he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading, and he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution, and the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all she's Jewish and second that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai who saved his life and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink so when he hears this news he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the 
creed day comes and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai establish by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, Purim. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation. Maybe you have become queen for this very moment. Maybe you, Refuge City Church, have been born right here and right now for this very moment to make a difference in your family, to make a difference in Klamath Falls, to make a difference in this world and in this time. Maybe you were born for right now. You see, Esther did not want to walk into the room that day to talk to the king, but she said yes anyway, even if it cost her her life. Her decision that day saved all of the Jewish people. Her decision that day led the children of Israel one step closer to the Savior's coming and to the world getting to know about Jesus as well. Church, I want to ask you this tonight. What is God trying to do with your yes? What is God trying to do in our world and in our time and in our church and in our community and in your family with your yes? What is God up to? Who could be saved? Who knows how many lives could be changed? No matter how hard it might be to give up control of your life to Jesus, when we do it, he promises that he will always make it worth it. Always, no matter how hard, no matter what it costs, he will always make it worth it. Church, will you say yes anyway? Will you say yes anyway? No matter what? No matter if it doesn't make any sense in your head. Even if God asks you to join a ballet class. Some of you are questioning right now. No matter what it costs you, will you say yes? That's what God is speaking in this place today. He's asking that question. Will you say yes to him? No matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, no matter how crazy it may seem, will you say yes to him? You see, the Bible's full of these moments when people said yes to God, and that yes changed everything for them and those around them. Let's jump into some of these. Noah said yes when God asked him to build the ark. Abraham said yes when God asked him to sacrifice his only son. Joseph said yes when God asked him to forgive his brothers who beat him and sold him into slavery. Moses said yes when God told him to go to Pharaoh and ask him to let the Israelites go. Rahab said yes when asked to hide the Israelite spies and risk her own life and the lives of her family. David said yes when God asked him to fight the giant Goliath with a slingshot and a few stones. 
Daniel said yes when God told him not to bow down and worship other idols. Mary said yes when the angel told her that she would carry God's son, Jesus. The disciples said yes when Jesus asked them to leave everything behind and follow him. And Paul said yes when God asked him to deliver the good news of Jesus to the Gentiles. Serving Jesus always comes down to four words. Will you say yes? Will you say yes? John chapter 14, starting at verse 23, says this. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Anyone who loves me will obey. Anyone who loves me will say yes. We will say yes. Church, will you say yes? I know I'm being repetitive tonight, but that is very on purpose. Will you say yes? Our lives are marked by the moments that we say yes to Jesus. But can I remind you that our lives are also scarred by the times that we say no to him. In the beginning of Acts 9, 9, we meet a man named Saul who has been persecuting Christians, killing them. But all of a sudden, he has a God encounter on his way to Damascus. We find Saul now laying on this road to Damascus, blind and needing help, scared and confused and not sure what to believe anymore. That's where Saul is. Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Here's what happens. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. What is Ananias saying to the Lord? Uh, God, you're crazy. I've heard all about this guy. I know what he's here to do. He's killing believers. And now you want me to go talk to him? Don't you realize, God, that that's going to put like crosshairs on me? Like, do you realize what you're saying? Because God, I don't think I, I don't think you know what you're saying right now. No way, Jesus. I don't want to do that. Could you imagine if the story would have stopped right there? Just imagine, Ananias is like, no, thank you, God, I'll pass on that. And God's like, oh, Ananias, I don't know what I was thinking, actually. You're so right. You better stay safe and sound at home, and I will make sure to keep you well-rested instead of serving. Amen. Okay, Ananias, you just enjoy your rest. You see, Saul, later Paul, went on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Without his ministry, billions, with a B, billions of Gentiles would not have been able to hear the good news, that the good news was no longer just for the Jewish people. But God was now making the promise available to them as well. I don't know about you, but I am not a Jewish man, which means I'm one of those Gentiles that wouldn't have been able to receive the gospel if this man, Saul, who's blind and stuck and scared and confused, didn't hear the truth from the man named Ananias. Without his yes, my life would be totally different. Though Ananias did not see or understand quite yet, his obedience to this prayer was going to affect billions of people. His yes or his no was going to change the course of human history forever. Verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, 
The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. You see, Ananias' obedience changed so many lives, including his own. So my question tonight, whose lives will you impact if you said yes to Jesus right now? Whose lives? You see, it all starts when we say, Jesus, no matter what, no matter how hard it may seem, no matter how scared I am, I am yours, use me. You see, that is the prayer that I prayed when God asked me to join ballet. Looking back, I realize now that it wasn't about dancing at all, which is good because I wasn't the best. Uh, (laughs) It was about people. Our prayers are about people. And I wish I could begin to put to words the amount of lives that I have got to touch and be touched by in the course of that story, in the course of my yes. You see, I want to touch back with that young man. Because God was the one, I I prayed the prayer, right? Jesus, if there's any way that you could use me to make a difference in this young man's life. Hey, David, how about ballet? Well, you see, when you're one of the only guys in a class, guess what you do? You hang out together, right? And you spend time, and you talk, and you get to know each other, and you get to pray over one another. And slowly but surely, I saw the door of his heart softening and opening and softening and opening. opening. And within however long it was, two or three years, I watched as this young man's heart opened up to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. And all of a sudden, the prayers of his mother were answered because another was willing to say yes. Church, your yes or your no does not just affect you. We try far too often to believe that my, I can say no to that. I know God's calling me to join the worship team and it makes me uncomfortable and I'm going to say no and it only affects me because, well, it's my no. It's my right. Can I tell you something tonight? It does not only affect you. Esther's no would have killed a lot of people. My no would have led to a young man not getting to hear the truth. How about you tonight? What is God asking you to do? What is God calling you to? What is that thing that you know you're supposed to step into, but you're scared? Who is the person that you're, you're supposed to speak to and bring life to? Speak, like bring that truth and that hope of Christ into their life, but speaking up is really hard. God is calling you to say yes tonight. Obedience isn't about doing things our way. It's about doing things God's way because he sees the big picture and we trust him enough to do whatever he asks. Even though while we are still stuck in the puzzle, we trust that he knows exactly what pieces he's putting where. Obedience is about doing life God's way. Pastor Jimmy, church tonight, will you say yes? Will you say yes? Stand with me tonight. I want to spend some time with the Lord. I really want to pray over a few different groups of people. If you feel tonight like God is calling you to serve in a ministry or an outreach or missions, if you feel like you're called to do something, and for whatever reason it has been so hard to say yes, but you feel God tugging on your heart, And you know you're supposed to jump into it. You know you're supposed to say yes. If that's you tonight, will you just simply raise your hand? Come on. Come on. Church, if there's someone around you, can we just lay our hands on them tonight? I just want to take a few minutes and just pray. We're a family here tonight, amen? Amen. So we're standing with one another because we believe that God's promises are true and we're not going to back down off of that. And so, Father, I thank you for every hand that went up tonight. God, we know that you're calling us to do something. Whatever ministry or opportunity that may be, Father, we know that it's you. 
And so, Jesus, right now, we speak to the fear and we say, you must go in Jesus' name. And God, I pray that your voice and your hope and your truth and your promises would just begin to arise in their heart, God, that all they would remember is that they said yes. And yes, maybe in the process of walking the day-to-day might be scary, but God, that the remembrance of the yes that we gave you would be even greater. We said yes, Jesus, because you said yes for us. You died for us. You said yes to us. You believed in us. And so if you believed in us that much, God, how can we be afraid now? And so, Father, I just pray for us as we're stepping in and stepping out and just believing you at your word. God, use us. Use us, Jesus. No more fear. No more saying no. No more hiding. God, if this is your truth and this is your promise and you are calling us to step out, we pray for the doors to open up and the faith to walk through it. God, I pray for a bunch of believers that would not have their heads held low, but God, we would raise our chins and believe that our God sent us. God, help us not be afraid anymore. Because if you are for us, then who, who can be against us? So God, even when that who is us, <laughs> God, I thank you that you are enough. And so God, I thank you for the faith that will arise in this place. I thank you for the ministries. I thank you for the churches. I thank you for the missions and the the outreaches that you're going to begin to do through this room because there's a group of people that believe that you are calling them to step out. So Jesus, tonight, we just speak over their life. You say yes. You say yes. So if you said yes to us, we say yes to you. Thank you for that, Jesus. If tonight... You feel like God has been stirring your heart to begin to tell others about him. Maybe it's those that are in your family, at work, at school, in the grocery store. You feel the tug on your heart. You want to speak, but all of a sudden there's that thing that kind of like closes your mouth and you're like, I don't know what this is and I'm done with it. Pastor David, I want to tell people about how good my God is because if he did what he did for me, then how can I be quiet? If that's you tonight, will you just raise your hand? I'm ready to to tell the world about Jesus. Come on. Come on. If there's someone around you, lay your hands on them. Father, tonight, I thank you for that. Mm. If you died for us, If you did what you did for us, then how can we keep quiet? But God, I pray that you would begin to use us like like a lamp on a hillside, that when you turn the light on, the whole world can see. And so, Father, I thank you for the men and the women that raised their hands tonight saying, I'm tired of the devil putting his finger on my lips. I'm tired of being held back from speaking truth and hope and what God is doing. I am tired of it. So, God, tonight, I thank you for the freedom that we would begin to speak. God, that you would use us everywhere we go. That, God, we would begin to see what you are doing in people's lives. That we would begin to call out prophetic words. That we would begin to call out hope. God, sometimes we just need to look someone in the eye and say, God sees you. God, may may we not be afraid of that. May we not be afraid of that. I heard someone today say, we live in such a dark world. And if the worst thing we can do is love someone, then that's not so bad. So God, I thank you that we have nothing to be afraid of. May the love that you have for your people begin to stir in us. May your love in us be greater than the fear. I thank you that fear has no place in us. So God, I pray for every one of these people that tomorrow you would set aside a divine opportunity, that they would know without question that this is the divine moment that you've asked them to speak. And it's going to be hard. It's going to feel scary. They're going to feel the very same pressures they've always felt. But there is a boldness that comes when we know that God is the one that put us there. So as we begin to speak, we don't speak with our own accord. We speak with his. And so Father, I thank you that as they come to that moment that they would speak because they know you're right there. They're not alone in that room. 
They're not alone in that hallway, but Jesus, your Holy Spirit, is right next to us. And so when we grab their hands to pray, your hands are right there too. God, may we never forget that you're always with us. Always there. And so, Father, I thank you for every hand that went up, that from this moment on, this moment on, we would not let fear have a, have a say in us anymore. From this point on, when we feel that tug on our heart, that we would speak, that we would love, that we would encourage. And I thank you, God, that through the men and the women in this place, that we're going to see our family, our community, and our nation become a different place because we need hope in 2024. We need love in 2024. We need truth right now. And so, God, we just thank you because if each and every one of us just speak when you ask us to, the world will never be the same. So, God, I thank you for the confidence in every one of them in Jesus' name. And tonight, if God is calling you to give your life to him, you're here in this place, and you're like, I've never said yes to Jesus. I didn't know. I didn't know if I really believed. I didn't know if I really thought this was true. But, Pastor David, tonight I feel something. And, Pastor David, tonight I... I don't want to go home the same person that walked into this church. And I want to say yes to Jesus. If that's you tonight, will you raise your hand for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there's a hand, if someone raised around you, can we just lay our hands on them? There's some hands around, so please just look for them. Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that we are your sons and we are your daughters. No matter what, no matter what's happened in this life, no matter what we've done or what's been done to us, we are your kids. And Father, you love us. And sometimes the stuff that life throws our way makes it really hard to feel that or believe that in our hearts. But I thank you, Jesus, that when your Holy Spirit shows up, the lies are broken. Father, I pray for every hand that is raised right now saying, Jesus, I'm all in. I want to say yes to you. Jesus, I pray that you would surround them with your Holy Spirit. Wrap them up right now in a big Father God hug. Let them know that you're present and that you love them and that you're near them and that you're never going to walk away. Never. No matter what their earthly dads have done or people in their life, they've walked away. But our Heavenly Father will never, ever, ever leave us. If that was you tonight that raised your hand, can you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I give you my life. I know I walked into this church not believing, not sure, and on the fence. But Jesus, as I leave, I give you my life. I believe that you died on that cross and that you rose again so that I could live with you for eternity. And so Jesus, I say it and I mean this. I say yes. Mm. If you prayed that prayer tonight, if you prayed that prayer tonight, <laughs> the heavens just open up and God is applauding, saying, my son, my daughter, I see you, I know you, I love you. Come on. God's just getting warmed up in you. God is just getting warmed up in you. Maybe tonight you gave your life to Jesus before, but you know you got off track. If that's you, can you just raise your hand and say, okay, I got off the rails, but it's time to get back on. Come on, I see the hands, I see the hands. So I wanna pray. I wanna pray for you too. So one more time, if that was you, raise your hands. I wanna get people to pray for you, lay their hands on you, I see the hands. Come on, if you see some of their hands up, let's lay our hands on them, church. Come on. Jesus. 
Jesus, we know sometimes we get so easily distracted. But Father, I thank you that you have never taken your eyes off of the prize. You've never forgotten your promise. You've never forgotten your call that you have on each and every single one of us. So Father, as we raise our hands tonight and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the past. But from this moment on, we're going to draw a line in the sand and say, devil, you can't have me anymore. My life is Jesus's and no one's else. So, Father, I thank you that those hands that went up, God, that is a supernatural act. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are going to begin to pour your Holy Spirit into them, your truth, your promises, your destiny. God, that they would know that you are not done with them. It is so easy for us to feel like what we've done disqualifies us from the call. And God, I thank you that you do not believe that. You say you're not done. You say the promise still stands. And so God, I thank you tonight that as we raise our hands and say, I'm done with who I used to be. God, that tomorrow, that as our light shines and as people see us, they're going to look at us and say, who are you and what happened to the you I saw yesterday? And you can look at them with that big smile on your face and say, I gave my all to Jesus yesterday. And the best, the best, the best is yet to come. So, Father, tonight we just thank you for who you are and all that you're doing. God, I believe that you are calling your church to stand up and say yes. Your church to arise and stop being afraid. To believe that when you call us to something, you're going to see us through it. God, we have believed that you are not big enough. But if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, then there is nothing impossible for us. And so, Father, right now we pick up our faith. It may seem small. It may seem insignificant. But, God, I thank you that as we cast our mustard seed into the soil of who you are and what you're calling us to do, that, Jesus, you're going to grow something big and beautiful out of our lives. Jesus. Jesus. We just want to live for you. Jesus, we just want to live for you. We don't want to be distracted anymore. We don't want to have our, our head or our eyes to the left or to the right, but Jesus, right on you. So God, I pray as we leave this place today that you would grab our cheeks <laughs> and help us to see you. Help us to know what you're saying to us. God, face to face, eye to eye. God, that we would know that this isn't a David thought or a Pastor Jimmy thought. This is a Jesus thought in me. And so when you speak to us and call us to something, I thank you, God, that our answer will always be yes. May that be who we are for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give Jesus a round of applause? Come on. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for that. Come on.
God, you're so good. God, you're so good.